Joe, were you drafted or did you enlist? Um, I received my draft notice. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, listed as number 41 on the, on the, um, in the draft as it was, and um, I made up my mind at that point to uh, enlist rather than to be drafted. Okay, you say your number was 41. Can you explain what you mean by your number? I received a letter in the mail from Uncle Sam stating that um, we inform you that you've been drafted uh, into the United States services and your draft number is 41 and it went by your year, your, the day you were born, or your year of birth actually. And um, I was in the last group of people that were going to be for the selected service at that, at that point in time, stemming back from, I'm thinking, World War II. Um, so rather than wait for them to pick me to go somewhere, I decided I'd rather pick my course of action and, and enlisted in the Navy. Why did you choose the Navy? <clears throat> I had a brother-in-law who was in submarine duty at the time, and I got to go on the base and actually go on board the sub and got to talk to a lot of people. And they told me up front, this is what you can expect, uh, starting from going into boot camp, actually, to getting into the active duty service and thought it was a, a good career choice at that time. Um, so I decided to enlist. Do you remember what year it was and where you were living at the time? Um, at the time, I was living in uh, East Berlin, Connecticut, and um, I had just graduated from Berlin High School, which was 1971, and this was, uh, I, I believe, uh, September of 71 when I went to the recruiting office. Do you recall your first days in service? Where did you go right after you enlisted? Um, as soon as I enlisted, my parents uh, were told to drive me to the Springfield um, Federal Building. And they dropped me off and said goodbye, and then I went in and immediately started my induction process. Um, within that period of time, I went through a physical uh, to check me out top to bottom. Um, from there, they put us on a bus, gave us a plane ticket, and stuck us all on a plane and headed us to uh, um, Great Lakes Training Center in Illinois. Now, when you went for your induction in Springfield, did you know any of the other people at the time? Did you go with a bunch of guys from Connecticut? Were you all on your own? There was nobody else from Connecticut except me. Everybody else was from Springfield and, and other parts, uh, probably within a um, few hundred mile radius. Um, at that, and then, like I said, they they took us to the airport and stuck us on a plane, and and you went to Illinois. Where did you go in Illinois? Um, it was it was. I didn't know the exact location other than the Great Lake Training Center because as soon as we landed, they put us on a bus and they immediately took us to the Great Lakes Training Center. And, and by how the, long did you stay there? 13 weeks. And that was for your basic training? Basic training. What did that consist of? Um, a lot of yelling and screaming at first. <laughs> um, it, it's The uh, uh, best way I can describe it is if you can imagine being in a, a calm setting and... and sleeping and waking up the next morning and then all of a sudden somebody's screaming and banging on a garbage can and telling you to get up and get dressed and do this and do that and that went on for like five weeks the first five weeks um, and we didn't understand what the purpose was until we actually got into active duty and got into a combat situation then you appreciate why they did that to you why did they do that um, it, it keeps you on it, it gets you to be on guard to to realize that if something out of the ordinary happens, you're going to react to it right away because in certain situations, you don't have time to sit there and think and, and wipe your eyes and wake up. You have to move. Um, and, and we're talking about a matter of seconds. Um, and there was a certain incidents that happened uh, when I got on board the ship and we went into a combat zone where you had a minute and a half for 6,000 people to be on general quarter stations uh, in the event of an incident. So your training paid off in those cases? That's what they did it for. That's correct. Now, what was your 13 weeks at boot camp like? Did you have any memorable experiences? Um, outside of the first five weeks of all the yelling and screaming, uh, you learned how to do just about everything you could think of associated with being in the Navy. Um, shipboard life, um, learning how to tie knots, how to shoot, um, because in certain situations you had to be armed uh, on board vessels. Um, they physically made you phys uh, physical training, um, you know, the, the typical things of, of getting you in shape. Um, and a lot of it was classroom. A lot of it was sitting there and, and studying, like I said, all the different facets of uh, being in the Navy. Do you remember any of your instructors? Um, I don't remember them by name, but I, it was a, a chief uh, gunner, actually a chief uh, gunner's mate 
who was a chief petty officer at the time. And that was, um, he was there as his last duty station, so to speak. He was going to retire. Um, I believe after our class, he retired. <coughs> Excuse me. Did you actually go aboard any ship during your training, or was everything on land? No, everything was on land, and everything was simulated. They actually had a, um, a half uh, portion of a ship um, with the um, actual... Um, Built inside, just like if it was on a boat, and, and what they did was they taught you damage control, how to fight fires on board a ship, and the whole, you know, everything, like I said, associated with that. Um, so when we did get on board, it, it wasn't foreign or alien to you. You, It, it, it res resembled the training that they gave you. Oh, it really so it did. Pretty much exactly. Yeah, it was. was. After your 13 weeks, did you have a graduation? Yes, we did. It was a full-dress graduation in blues at that time because it was cold, um, so we had our dress blues on <clears throat> um, with the, the typical white sailor hat at that time, what they had. Um, my parents were allowed to come to the graduation. Um, we had a nice dinner afterwards. We were allowed to spend two hours with our parents, and we had to say goodbye to them, and that was it. They had to leave. Um, immediately the next morning, we were handed uh, our orders and a plane ticket, and we each got on an airline heading somewhere. In my case, I was given a plane ticket to uh, Alameda, California, um, to meet my ship, which was coming back from a tour in uh, Vietnam. Now, did you know at that point you were going to Vietnam? Uh, I did not, but I had a suspicion because they were still running missions over there. So uh, it, it was pretty much a given that you were going to go. And we weren't that concerned about it at the time because usually at that age, you're 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 <clears throat> pretty aggressive and you th think nobody's going to hurt you or touch you or anything like that. So you didn't have too much concern that you were going to be in harm's way or, or in a combat zone. And So when you got to Alameda, California um, to get your ship, what was your ship that you were getting? Um, I was given orders to report to the USS Enterprise, uh, CBAN-65, which was an aircraft carrier. It was actually the first aircraft carrier, that uh, nuclear aircraft carrier that was uh, built. Now, did you have any special training for a specific job in the Navy, or were you just generally trained for everything? You were generally trained in the everyday facets of being in the Navy sir or Naval Service. But no, uh, going on board the ship, we I did not at that point have a particular um, MOS, I believe they called it. <clears throat> um, so what happened was is they took a group of about uh, 18 of us who were all waiting for the ship to come back, and they brought us on board the boat and they put us into the uh, hangar deck and we sat there and what happened was is commanders from the different units would come up to you and ask you are you interested in this would you like to do this and they actually gave you a choice and one guy came up and, and uh, stuck his hand out shook my hand so he introduced himself I, I believe his name was Henderson but I'm not sure he said I'm lieutenant commander <clears throat> and he said and I'm uh, in charge of the weapons department and this is what we do he says is that sound like something you'd like to do and I said I believe it does, sir. And he said, well, follow me. And off I went. And Why from, did you choose him? Only because he seemed to be uh, more personable than the rest of them. And, and he seemed to be sincerely interested in, in trying to put me on a career path. Found out later, I mean, the only reason they picked you was they wanted a body, naturally, to, to fill a billet. Um, <laughs> but it, it worked out in my favor. It, it was a, an interesting uh, three years uh, after that. And uh, so when he when you went with him, then that meant you were going to be trained in weapons. Uh, weapons of all kind. That's correct. And when I mean weapons, I don't mean like uh, I mean yes, I, I knew how to use small arms, uh, light weapons, shotguns, um, M sixty one A one machine guns, um, fifty caliber, twenty millimeter anti aircraft. <clears throat> but the main part of it was uh, building bombs, rockets, missiles, uh, napalm. Um, and a few other types that I can't remember right now. That They had uh, quite an assortment on there. So you had to learn all of those? Yes. I, I was given immediate training within uh, the first two weeks I was on board how to handle and be around this type of equipment. So how long were you in California before you actually shipped out? Two weeks. And then you left, and how long were you more? We went on what they call a shakedown cruise. <clears throat> we went uh, off the coast of California for two weeks. 
And um, in that time, they, they taught us, they, they ran the ship through all kinds of drills. You had uh, general quarters practicing. <clears throat> general quarters prepares you to, they, they assign you a specific sta uh, station. When they have general quarters, they want you to go to the station and man that station. That's what you do, uh, regardless of what's happening around you. Um, you're given these uh, sounding kind of phones. Uh, I can't remember the exact name of them. And you report in, and if they ask you to do a specific thing, you do it. I was in charge of a a, um, a panel that had um, kind of control handles on it. And what I, what I found out later on, it was for all the bomb magazines. And when you squeezed and, and twisted these handles, it uh, initiated the sprinkler systems in the bomb magazines. So that was uh, one of my duties that, that I started. So whenever you would be called the general quarter? That was my duty station, station. yep. And was that... The same throughout your time? No, it, it, it changed as time went on and, and, and to meet the need that they had. Uh, other particular times you went to General Quarters, you were uh, <clears throat> you were moving bombs around, uh, bringing them up from the magazines to bring them up to the flight deck to, to load them on the plane so they could fly their sorties. Uh, when, all right, after your shakedown cruise of two weeks, then where did you go? Uh, we immediately uh, shipped out for uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. And we uh, moored actually uh, alongside of the uh, USS Arizona. We were right across from it. Um, that was to pick up our orders uh, from the Admiral of the Fleet at that time. And from we spent, I believe it was four days in there. Got to see a little bit of Hawaii, <coughs> Waikiki Beach. Uh, you know, so you could leave the ship. You could leave the ship. Yeah, you got leave and you could leave the ship and go touring around what little bit of time you had. Uh, other times you had duty, you had to stand watches, things like that. So that's where you actually got your orders. Is that when you found out you were going to Vietnam? Yes. We had a suspicion that that's where you were heading anyway, but that's where they stop on the way over. Um, so once we got our orders, in the four days, we shipped out and headed to uh, Subic Bay Naval Station in the Philippines. How long did you stay there? Uh, about... Four days, I believe, again, and it was just to pick up supplies, replenish, uh, pull on aviation fuel. Um, <clears throat> and then it was, then they didn't tell us at that exact time where we were going until we actually got out of port. And when you got out of port, where did they tell you? Um, the captain came over and made an announcement and said, We are now proceeding to um, the Tonkin Gulf to Yankee Station. Um, you're going to be in a combat zone and explain, you know, that we're going to do. Uh, bombing sorties and we're going to run 24 7 and um, that's when we started working 18-hour uh, shifts. Ah. Now this might be a good time can you tell me about the USS Enterprise as an aircraft nuclear aircraft carrier what it was like and she was um, the, like I said the first uh, nuclear aircraft carrier that was built um, she was 1,123 feet long she was over 15 stories tall she displaced 90,000 tons, and she had a complement of 6,000 men at that time. Unfortunately, there was no women in the service when I was in. They didn't come until a, a year or two after I got out. <clears throat> um, normal ship's company was only 2,500 crew, which I was uh, one of. I was the regular ship's crew. Um, the rest of the complement was the air wing who came on board. Um, we usually picked up the air wing um, before we left California and got over to Subic Bay and our air wing would fly on as soon as we left, would get out of port off the California coast, they would fly on and store the, uh, the airplanes of, of various kinds um, because we had uh, several different kinds of fighters. They, so, they put the airplanes on the carrier? In they the flew on. Oh. They flew on and they would trap. They would catch a wire and trap on board. And While you were out at sea? While we were out at sea, yeah. That must have been interesting. It was, yeah. I have, um, <laughs> which is antiquated for this day and age, I have actually Super 8 movies of, of uh, the air sorties that were going on, and I actually still have a movie projector that shows them. It still works, uh, which is uh, almost 34 years old now. So how many aircraft were on board? Um, <laughs> the, the government used to like to tell the people that it would hold 80 planes, but um, I'm here to tell you there was more. <laughs> like how many? Um, at, at one point we were flying, there was uh, close to 125 oh. between fighters, reconnaissance, uh, the, the, the particular planes that were for um, radar jamming, um, helicopters for rescue. All right, so then you were headed to the Tonkin Gulf? 
Um, yeah. So when we left Subic Bay, we headed over to the Tonkin Gulf. They called it Yankee Station. So we stayed on Yankee Station anywhere from 40 to 45 days at a clip. Um, and you would, uh, <clears throat> we would uh, just cruise around the, uh, the ocean there and fly stories, like I said, and we worked 18 hour days. And uh, you, depending on when your shift started, you would get up and, and depending on what was going on for that day, you might be in a particular bomb magazine. You might be doing maintenance on sprinkler systems. You might be cleaning weapons. You might be standing guard uh, on a 20 millimeter anti-aircraft battery uh, alongside the, the, uh, the flight deck. Um, it just depended. Um, my actual um, rank at the time I came on board was was a seaman, which is a uh, um, a three striper, um, and I didn't earn a rank of gunner's mate third class until probably a year and a half later. But you did a a very you know a varying amount of of jobs that that was uh, required. So you didn't just stay with the weapons when you were on board. Well, oh yes, I did. Yeah, that's that was my whole. That was part of the weapons group, or rockets, bombs, missiles, twenty millimeter. Um, we had to load fuses. We had to build bombs, put missiles together. <clears throat> I was also um, attached to the um, what they called the SAS. Um, the SAS group, um, SAS group was for the uh, nuclear weapons, which we never knew if we had them or didn't have them. They wouldn't tell you. <clears throat> so all of these other jobs that you might be doing were right within the weapons? Within the weapons department, that's correct. My physical assignment where I actually reported every day was called the ship's armory. And the ship's armory was where they kept all the small arms for the pilots. And we also maintained them. We used to break them down, clean them, put them back together again. Um, like I said, we also had a, 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 we were in charge of the other arsenal. We had a detachment of Marines on board, about 150 uh, guys. Um, they all had all their own uh, sidearms, uh, small, uh, small weapons, 50 caliber or whatever. <clears throat> they were there to provide um, support to the ship in case there was a, a, a close-in firefight or if we had to do a landing of any kind. Um, and we, uh, the people from weapons department were assigned to um, a particular patrol if we had to go um, and you had an assignment and they just, you just knew when they called you, if you, you know, had to do a particular thing. Um, so it, you know, like I said, depending on the day and the situation, you, you just had different, uh, different jobs to do. So you really didn't have a typical day where you got up and did the same thing. No, as soon as you woke up, um, the first thing you were supposed to do, and I, I'm not going to say it the way they told you to get up, because they used a very colorful words. Um, nobody ever spoke plain English when you were on the ship, and uh, they would tell you to to go shower, get dressed, grab a bite to eat, and then you know report to the ship's armory. And you would go there, and uh, they would say, "Okay, this is your assignment for the day." Excuse me. <clears throat> and, and like I said, they might send you to a magazine to to uh, put bombs together. Um, another thing we did is um, at that time they didn't have auto loaders for the planes. So in order to feed them their, their 20 millimeter anti-aircraft, um, we used to have to go down and, and the 20 millimeter anti-aircraft round was about that big. And um, we would have to take them out of a metal case and we would have to break them out of their, um, they had, um, I can't think of the right name for them, like metal clips that were holding them all together in a row in a band like. And we'd have to break them out and put them on a conveyor and feed them into a drum. And then we'd send the drum up a, a, a bomb elevator and it would go up to the flight deck and the flight crew who were, uh, they had weapons people assigned to them too, would take the drum, take it up, put, put a, like another kind of feeder belt on it and feed in the ammunition. It would take us um, somewhere in the neighborhood of an hour and a half to load 6,000 rounds into this drum. Um, it would take them a matter of five minutes to load the 6,000 rounds into the plane. It would take the plane... Um, no more than 10, 15 seconds to empty the 6,000 rounds. And, and it's uh, a sound that I can't really describe other than to say when they would press the pickle, as they would say, all you could hear was, and it was done, gone, 6,000 rounds. Um, now, you said that you were you would be at Yankee Station for 40 to 45 days Correct. at a time. So this is out in the middle of the Tonkin Gulf and you wouldn't see land at all during that time? You would just be on duty for 18-hour shifts for that amount of time? That's correct. 
You would see no land. Um, once in a while, you might see another ship, but generally, no. It was just you and the ocean. Now, while we were there, we did have protection. <clears throat> we had our own planes, of course, flying cover 24 hours a day. We have a uh, very sophisticated radar, which I don't know all the particulars on, um, but it was enough to see hundreds of miles away anything that was within a certain radius of the boat. Um, we also had um, cruisers, destroyers, and submarines uh, along with us. Um, so when we left, you left with a, a quite a flotilla of uh, ships. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what was the main mission of the USS Enterprise being out in the Tonkin Gulf? Um, we were taking our turn on the line, as they called it, and um, we were replacing another group of ships that was out there um, so they could go in and get a little R&R, &R, a little rest, um, just to give them a little downtime because it is uh, highly stressful when you're out there and you're you're always on guard because you never know. Because in addition to just out there cruising around, we also had the uh, Vietnamese who were using Russian-made um, boats, aircraft, um, what have you, would try and come out to uh, antagonize us or, or even try to shoot us out of the water. Um, in all the cases while I was on board, they were not successful, uh, I can tell you firsthand. Um, we also had the, the actual Russian military who used to fly observations on us all the time, and it was a game uh, to them. What we found out later on, they would do flyovers, we would do flyovers. Um, they would send out <clears throat> these boats that looked like fishing trawlers, but they were really spy ships, um, just to keep tabs on us to see what we were doing. Um, there were instances where they would try and uh, get in your way and, and cause you to, to have to uh, divert the ship or something like that, in which case we would go to general quarters and we would let them know that we knew what they were doing and we'd... Uh, send a few planes their way and we'd fire a couple of rounds over their bow and uh, ju just to let them know that we knew and uh, <clears throat> then we would move on. So then when you were done with your 40 to 45 days out at sea, then you w where would you go? It depended where you were at that point in time. <clears throat> Unfortunately, one of the, the things about being on the boat is outside of the uh, probably the captain and a, and a few other high-ranking officers, you never knew exactly where you were. So one minute we could end up going into the Philippines, which was kind of like our second home port, the Subic Bay. Um, next time we ended up in um, Singapore. Uh, another time we ended up in Hong Kong. Um, and and dur uh, various durations during during the cruising, um, we ended up in about seven or eight different ports. Oh, wow. So and every time you would leave Yankee Station, another group of ships... And would be out there to replace us. That's correct. Okay, so then when you left there and you went to these other ports, was that R&R &R or you still were on duty? You're still on duty, but you also had time off. Um, one of the times we went into Hong Kong, I was uh, we were there long enough. I was granted what they call the 96-hour leave. So I got four full days, <clears throat> and myself and uh, two other of my shipmates, we decided to go and live it up just to experience the city. And, and so we went... Um, we went top shelf for the time, uh, which the exchange rate back then was uh, very lucrative for us. <clears throat> so for one of our dollars, we could get seven or eight of one of theirs. So we stayed at the Hong Kong Hilton, which was five star. Um, we ate in the, in the restaurant there, which was five star. Um, we got treated very well, very nicely. Um, we, we were happy to be there and they were happy to see us and uh, it was good for their economy. And uh, we got to do a lot of sightseeing and I took pictures and movies and... Uh, we had a good time. It was, uh, you know, a nice time for you just to chill out and uh, get yourself back to being human again, so to speak. Now, when you would, when you'd have this off time, when you'd be in the other ports, how long, would that be for forty to forty-five days before you go back? Oh no, no, no. The, in this particular case, um, I think we were in Hong Kong for um, five days, and like I said, I was fortunate to have four of them off. Uh, and then you would go back to Yankee Station. <clears throat> That's correct. Calling? Yeah. Oh, so... And this went on for the first cruise for nine and a half months, and the second one was eight and a half months. So you were on two cruises in Vietnam? I was, yes, I did two two tours, they called it. And the first one was how long? Um, nine and a half months. And the second one? Was eight and a half months. Was it the same for both tours? Did anything change? Um, yes, um, there, there were... 
changes in the way that we flew combat missions. Um, <clears throat> there was changes in the ordnance. There was changes in the aircraft that we had on board. Um, the first cruise we went out, our, our main fighter support was uh, the F-4 Phantom. Um, the second cruise we went out, we had we were the first ones to launch the F-14 Tomcats at that time, which they were fairly new. We were the first ones to use them in a combat situation and, and off of a, a carrier-based um, while we were on duty or, or on station, I should say. Wow, well, that was pretty historic then. Uh, yes, it was. Did yeah. you realize the importance of that at the time? Oh, yeah, we were told. You know, we were told up front, you know, this is what we were there for and we were going to test them out. And, and we... Uh, we did actually get to uh, to test the, the Tomcats in several situations where we uh, um, the Russians like to test your military strength out from time to time. So they decided to send um, a couple of um, patrol boats out of uh, Hanoi Harbor after us. And they also sent a flight of MiGs. And I'm not sure which ones they were at the time, um, but they were. Um, so we launched 24 fighters um, because we had two two different air wings on board. Um, and we sent the 24 fires out fully loaded for the boats and the planes, and they came back probably less than an hour later. None of their ordnance on board on board the planes, and they reported a 100% kill. Uh, the boats were gone, and the planes were gone. Wow. As a matter of fact, we went 15 minutes after they had all landed. We went by where the two ships supposedly were, and there was nothing. Nothing left. What year was this? Um, the first cruise started out in, uh, I believe it was March of 72, <clears throat> and went until, um, I believe, into 73. Uh, we went back out again in 73, uh, into 74, and then we also did a stint um, from 74, 75 in the Indian Ocean. Did you ever actually see combat while you were on duty? Um, combat as far as one-on-one -on -one or, or up close and personal, no. Uh, combat is in a combat zone. That's the best I can uh, say that I was a part of. Uh, the closest that I got to <clears throat> any real physical fighting was um, toying with the Vietnamese coming out to try to shoot us or, or the, uh, the Russians uh, trying to uh, mess with us a little bit. Um, I, I did get to fire weapons of, of multiple choice in a combat situation, but not at a human being, say, as close as you and I are sitting right now. Um, and, and that was an issue that uh, <laughs> haunted me for a while later on um, because of the fact that when I wasn't in a in country, as, as it was said by the hardcore veterans, um, the fact that I considered myself a Vietnam veteran was not uh, relevant to them. Were there any casualties in your unit? Um, we lost six planes. Um, two I got to watch uh, go in the drink. Um, <clears throat> there was a situation where when you're launching f uh, flight ops, um, at that time the, the uh, planes are launched by a steam catapult. Steam catapult hooks up to the front of the plane flies them off the end of the deck at 140 miles an hour, and it's up to the plane to then kick in its uh, its afterburners and, and take off. And uh, what happened in this particular instance, uh, they believe they called it a cold cat. Uh, it wasn't enough steam pressure, but they didn't. somebody didn't check for whatever reason, and the plane went off the end and did a, a nosedive into the drink. And when you're out in the middle of the ocean, there's no way for them to punch out because it's too fast. Um, so they only had two options at that time. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Um, yeah, in front of me on the table is a, um, a glass case of, of the uh, ribbons and medals that I w received during my service. Um, the, uh, the main ribbon that they give you initially is, um, oh, I forgot the name of it already. Um, I don't know if the camera's going to be able to pick it up or not, but I'll, I'll hold it up so you can see the display. It's the... Uh, um, Defense ribbon, which is um, up here in this corner over. I, I'm not sure to what angle there. Yeah. Um, but I have. Um, I received um, the South Vietnamese uh, ribbon and medal and the uh, Vietnamese uh, ribbon and medal um, with two campaign stars. 
um, for the, the two different uh, campaigns that we were a part of. I was actually a part of three different campaigns, but the uh, um, I was in uh, the um, middle to tail end of linebacker one. I was also part entirely of linebacker one. Linebacker one was a code name that they assigned to a certain bombing mission. What was what specifically was that? Um, we don't know all the details behind it. <laughs> oh. uh, uh, it, it wasn't. Uh, it was classified information, so they wouldn't tell us. We just got to hear the the colorful name that they assigned to it. Um, same thing in the first cruise. It was uh, the tail end of linebacker one, uh, the start of linebacker two. Um, the second into the third was the the rest of linebacker two, and then an operation they called frequent wind. Frequent wind, um, which they televised very highly, was uh, and they still show uh, archival footage footage of it right now. Is when they were. Um, evacuating Saigon and, and airlifting um, <clears throat> the American personnel and also the, uh, the South Vietnamese um, personnel that were attached to, I guess, the Americans at that time. Now, your uh, boat was a part of that operation? Yes, it was, yeah. You were on board? Can yes. you describe that in more detail? Um, they were doing, uh, they brought the ship, uh, well, at the start of this, the, what they did was, um, I'm not sure which, uh, I, I believe it was the Navy in, in combination with a few other services, um, <clears throat> mined Hanoi Harbor. Um, that was the start of it. So what we did was uh, we went in, we were about 25 miles off the coast at that point, uh, patrolling back and forth and sending uh, air flight, uh, what they called cover, cover flights uh, for fighters uh, for the evacuation. So the event that if another... Uh, country or, or let, let's say the Vietnamese or the Russians decided that they didn't like the operation and wanted to intervene, we had, we were providing f uh, fighter cover for the evacuation. Uh, that was our main mission at that time. You as a sailor on board, did you know what the mission was and did you yes, know they we did. evacuating Saigon? We were told and we were on, uh, we were pretty much not at general quarters, but we were pretty much at a heightened state. Um, for pretty much the whole time it took to do that. And, and I'm sorry, I don't recall all the exact dates and, and how long this took, but um, during our portion that we were there for, um, <clears throat> we were running uh, our still our 18-hour days, and um, we had a lot of our, um, our small arms main batteries. We were carrying this stuff on us all the time. Um, I was manning a 20-millimeter mount uh, uh, off of the flight deck, uh, planes were buzzing by me um, as I was standing up there, which is the case when you you know when you're flying air ops. Um, 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 so I'm sorry. Um, and they also um, they were flying some of the um, evacuees on board the ship. Um, we had a certain percentage that they brought on board, and they were generally um, the Disney, the um, higher dignitaries that they had that were from the South Vietnamese government. That were working, of course, in, in uh, conjunction with the United States. They were flown on. The they were flown on the ship, and they were given a, a specific uh, berthing area, uh, sleeping quarters, and what have you. Um, they were fed and clothed with whatever we had. Um, and then, when that portion of the um, of of our participation in frequent wind was over, we were then to take them to the Philippines, or from the Philippines, they were flown. I'm, I'm not sure to where. Did you get to actually speak with any of these? Uh, we saw them in passing, but um, we didn't just really have a chance to sit down and talk to them, um, basically because we were on the job, if you want to say, and uh, we had a particular functions that we had to maintain um, while we were working. Now... Was that the end of your service in Vietnam? Um, at, the, at the end of uh, Operation Frequent Wind, um, we were then thought we were going home, and they proceeded to tell us no, that there was an incident that was uh, raising its ugly head in the Middle East, and it was at that point, unbeknownst to us, Muammar Gaddafi. <laughs> so we were sent to the Indian Ocean. Now, you were in the Philippines, though, because you had taken the... Yes, yeah, so we, we had just pulled into the Philippines, so we had uh, a couple of days in there, and then we were given uh, emergency orders to, to pull out. I think it was within 48 hours. 
Um, we didn't give you much rest. No, we didn't have any time to go into town or anything. Um, so we immediately got our orders and we headed out to the Indian Ocean. Um, while we were in the Indian Ocean, we had a, a we rescued a, a boat that was on fire. Of uh, I'm not sure what uh, origin the ship was from. Uh, we rescued, I think it was about um, eight to ten crew from the ship. They lost a couple. Um, <clears throat> we also had an incident where um, a typhoon had hit an island off the South African coast called Mauritius, um, and we were asked to um, lend any kind of aid, support, whichever, because unbeknownst to us, we were 1,500 miles away. Uh, we were the closest vessel of any kind that was to them that could offer any kind of assistance. Um, <clears throat> Without going into great particulars, I can tell you that within eight hours, we went 1,500 miles. Um, for a ship that's that big and 90,000 tons, we were moving. Um, to get there in less than eight hours was just unbelievable to any anybody's uh, scope of it. And I guess being on the water and on the ocean, <laughs> you're cutting a lot of... Uh, a lot of time and distance uh, because you can uh, get to the scene pretty rapidly. So we did. Um, we don't know exactly how fast we were going, but we do know it was in excess of 35 knots. <laughs> and they won't tell you the the exact speed. Wow. How <clears throat> long did you stay in the Indian Ocean? Um, we were there for probably, I think it was uh, three or four months. It was the tail end of our last cruise. Um, <clears throat> and the only... Um, the only port of call we had at that point in time was uh, Mombasa, South Africa. Um, it was not a place that, um, it actually had a lot of vacationing uh, British tourists there that were coming off of cruise liners, but um, for us to be there, it was not a very uh, welcoming environment to say the least. So now what year was this, 1974? Yeah, it was 74 into 75. And you hadn't been home at all in this whole time since you left out? Oh, no, 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 no. I, I did get to go home. Um, I believe I got to come home twice in the whole three years, 11 months, and 25 days that I was assigned. <laughs> but who's counting? But who's counting? So uh, so you had two instances where you could come home to the United States? That's correct, yes. One time was around Christmas, I believe, of, um, I, wa I want to say, 73. But I'm not sure because no, it wasn't '73 because we were we were bombing in '73. <clears throat> um, I, I, I'm sorry to say I don't recollect, but I, I did get to come home. How was that for you to be able to come home and then have to go back to a completely different world? Um, at, at that point in time, and I think most of the servicemen will agree with you. You've you've gotten to a, a state of being where you're kind of hard bitten at that point in time. <clears throat> um, it was nice to come home and see the family, but you, it was like you didn't belong. Um, you weren't meant to be there to be home kind of thing. Uh, it was more like you were meant to be with your buddies and on board the ship and, and, and doing what you had to do because when you left, you felt like you were uh, leaving them behind, you know, to uh, take up the slack, so to speak, or to do your job for you. Um, it, it was nice, like I said, it was nice to spend time and see the family, but it, it was also, as crazy as it sounds, nice to get back. No, I think that you're right. I think that's a common feeling. Um, now I'm going to ask you some questions about your daily life uh, while you were over in Vietnam. How did you stay in touch with your family? Um, we were allowed to write letters, but we were not allowed to state any specifics about what we were doing, where we were. But most of the time, we didn't know where we were, so it didn't matter. <laughs> we didn't have to make up any lies. We just would tell them we didn't know where we were. Um, <clears throat> sailing on the ocean was about the best I could tell them. I mean, we were allowed to say we were in the South China Sea, which I was surprised. And we were allowed to use the colorful name of Yankee Station, which was our... our uh, Patrol area, if you want to call it that. <clears throat> um, what was the food like? Um, at, at first, the food was hard to get used to because, of course, you came from an environment of, of eating mom's cooking and uh, <clears throat> and or dad's, and as, as the case may be. And um, it, it was not your mother's or your father's food. And uh, it took once you got used to it, it, it was very edible. And, and a lot of the time you had to eat it because that's all there was. I mean, we did have... Um, two ship stores on board where you could buy 
uh, snacks of, of just about any kind, candy, soda, that kind of thing. Um, we actually had um, a ship store where we could buy electronics for, for that time period. Um, we could buy small stereos, radios, you know, watches, uh, jewelry of, of a small amount, uh, that type of thing. You really didn't need it. So I really didn't uh, <clears throat> buy a lot of that kind of things. Um, I, I unfortunately was a smoker at that time. So they did have a, <clears throat> a ship store to buy cigarettes on board and they were very cheap for that time. We could get them uh, for 16 cents a pack and a dollar forty a cart. Uh, nowadays, people would probably uh, stampede a place if they could buy them for that amount. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you have enough supplies and all the material things that you needed? Um, while the ship was at sea, you did have to do what they called uh, refuelings. Um, and every so often, you would have a ship come steaming out of nowhere. And it was a, a, a supply ship. And, and we were a part of that as far as um, <clears throat> we would have to shoot the initial line over so they could set up uh, the high, what they called the high lines, and, and they would high line uh, bombs, food, uh, any kind of munitions you could think of. They also um, brought actually the fueling hoses over so they could replenish the, uh, the uh, aviation fuel for the jets. Um, that was all done while two ships were side by side moving along in the ocean um, at a relatively slow speed. Um, but while that was happening, we did have, of course, other ships around us and flights up above us keeping tabs you know it had to be pretty tricky to have two huge ships like that that close well the other ship looked like a um <laughs> for for fishermen out there they'll appreciate it, it looked like a, a a cork bobbin out in the ocean compared to us the, the supply ship was a lot smaller uh -huh. um so we literally if we were looking uh, from the flight deck we're looking down on it the boat looked about this big next to ours it really wasn't i mean it was a you know significant size ship for for a replenishing ship. Um, we also had, um, <clears throat> we would replenish a, a submarine from time to time, which was uh, hush hush for that time. And that was pretty uh, funny because they would tell you to go to report to your, your shooting station and you would get out there and you're looking around going like this, wondering where the boat is and there's no boat. And all of a sudden you'd see up out of the water and here comes the conning tower. And the boat would come alongside and they'd shoot a high line to them and they'd exchange films or movies and give them some ice cream and some fresh milk and they'd disappear again and take off and <laughs> did you feel pressure or stress on the job sometimes you did sometimes you didn't uh, it depended what the circumstances were if we were going to general quarters and we didn't immediately know what it was for that would uh, naturally put you in a stressful situation because now you're wondering is somebody trying to blow you out of the water or you know cause some other kind of uh mayhem that, that that you weren't privy to so you'd be on guard wondering what's going on and wanting to know you know and but everybody was good they did their job that's what you were trained for did you do anything special for good luck um no uh, I, <laughs> I didn't believe it at the at the time uh, didn't didn't think that was necessary being uh, 19 years old when i first went in um you're pretty pretty full of yourself um <laughs> you you think you're indestructible and nobody's going to hurt you or do anything to you. But uh, I'm sure there's uh, people out there that could uh, beg to differ with that statement. And uh, uh, there was uh, people that were put in a lot more harm's way than I were. And uh, What did you do for entertainment? Um, we did have uh, what they called closed circuit television. And they had uh, our own uh, television studio for uh for whatever it was on board the ship, uh, we would get, um, <clears throat> they would, I'm not sure how they would get them, but we would get, uh, I believe it was taped uh, versions of shows that people would see at home for that time, but we would get them uh, without the commercials. Um, so what you would watch a half an hour show, we'd see in about 15, 17 minutes, um, which was pretty interesting. You'd see it, you know, start to finish. Um, because a lot of times you might not have had time to watch a whole show or a two-hour movie, uh, being that you only had six hours of downtime on any given day. Um, and in some cases, that might not have even worked out because if you were flying uh, special air ops and they needed the, uh, the ammunition, that cut into your six hours of downtime. Um, in your six hours of downtime, you were afforded to eat, shower, get some rest, and then you had to turn right around and do it again. And I'm sure for people who were in combat, in country, as they say, or, or 
depending on where, where their uh, duty station was, uh, they may not have had any downtime at all. I don't know. Um, did you get to see any USO shows? Um, we did get to see one. Um, I'm trying to remember the lady's name. Um, she was uh, gracious enough to, uh, to come. We were actually, um, <laughs> speaking of USO, we were supposed to get Bob Hope. Um, he, he was coming to the Enterprise. Um, it was going to be a big do, a big extravaganza, and something happened where the show got detoured to some other port of call. Um, so we did not get the Bob Hope show, but the lady who did come was uh, very nice, and she brought uh, a few other people with her. And um, I think her name was Baker, um, but I can't remember her first name. I'm sorry to say, but, but they came right aboard. They came, yeah. They flew them on board the ship. Yeah, they helicoptered on the ship, and uh, they gave us a, a nice show at night. And w we had uh, a special dinner, which they partake uh, partook in, and they walked around, and you know, whoever had the time could go and you know, shake their hands and say hello to them and stuff like that. And if you weren't on duty or or, or doing something else. On any of your leaves, your short leaves, when you were in ports, did you get to travel to see any other places while you were overseas? Um, like I, I stated earlier, I did get to, uh, I toured, <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. <coughs> I got to tour, to see uh, Hong Kong twice and Singapore twice. So I made it a point uh, each time that I was in there to do something different or, so, you know, go see a different part. Um, you weren't allowed to stray too far away. They didn't want you to go t too much out of the city limits unless it was an organized um, tour group or something that was going out. Um, but for the time we had and for what was available to us, it was more than enough. I, I always made it a point to, to try and go off the beaten path uh, as much as possible, to go in traditional restaurants that were there, to uh, sample local food. And um, this one instance I had, I was in a restaurant in uh, Hong Kong. I went down a side street and I saw what looked like a restaurant. Sure enough, I went in and it was really all locals. I was the only... American, I would say, or, or English-speaking person in the place, uh, they were fine. Uh, they came over to me, and they they tried to speak what little bit of English they knew, and you basically just pointed on the menu um, what you thought it was, and they, they would, as best they could, tell you it was fish, beef, chicken, um, whatever, and um, so I ordered a fish dish, and as it was, it came out, it was a huge platter of all raw fish. And what it was is they brought a uh, what looked like a uh, fondue pot, and you cooked your you cooked your own. It was cut pieces of uh, fish, morsels like, and you cooked it yourself and ate it. It was uh, and you had rice and vegetables, and it, it was very nice, uh, very enjoyable for for what it was. Something you can't really or, or you can now. I mean, you can go to a sushi bar now, but <laughs> to be there at that time. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual event? Um, we did. Uh, we were fortunate enough when we were in the Indian Ocean. We had um, one downtime where they actually had a barbecue on the flight deck, and what they actually tried to do was they had um, they tried to hold what was uh, like ship, shipboard Olympics. Um, and you got to participate in in you know events. Uh, it, it was. Basically, uh, it was a track and field events. If you could do it, you know, if they had the equipment on board, they would do it. And, so what did you do? Uh, um, I ran in, in one of the sprinting events, but uh, I soon found out because when you have 6,000 people on board, the competition is very intense. So <laughs> I wasn't as good as I thought I was. <laughs> I was fast, but not fast enough. Did you have any other unusual events like that? Um not that I can recall. No, unfortunately, most of the time was uh, visiting the ports. I mean, it's not. We always had a very good time when we had to leave. When we could go on R and R or get off the ship. I mean, uh, a group of us would always get together and, go, you know, go have a, a a nice meal somewhere. Or if you could go into the the local town, we'd go into the town and experience the thing. So, it, yes, we 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 were afforded uh, nice times. Um, and, and I um, fondly look back and remember a lot of the visits and, and the people I was serving with and still do recall. I, I, I wish if it was possible to ever meet up with some of them again, but uh, it hasn't happened. <clears throat> That's, 
I was going to ask you about you. Do you recall any of your fellow soldiers, and did you stay in touch with anybody afterwards? I'm not soldiers, sailors. Um, ten years after I was out, we were just by coincidence having a family picnic, and the house phone rang, and I believe it was one of my family members answered it, and uh, the gentleman <clears throat> believed to, to say that uh, it was Michael Smith, and he was one of my one of my uh, bunkmates uh, on board the ship, and um, he lived in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, I believe he was still there at the time when he called me. So I got on board uh, on the phone and we were talking and we were going to try and get together. Well, at that time, um, the economy was terrible. This was, um, I believe it was 75, 76. Or no, I'm sorry, no, it was in the 80s. <clears throat> and the economy wasn't um, what it what it was, you know, in, in years between now and then. And uh, it, I couldn't afford to even think about getting on a plane. Um, I, I had a car, but the car wasn't anything that I would trust to make a... a even a partial, you know, uh, cross-country cruise or, or whatever trip, I mean. And um, so we tried to, um, we were going to keep in touch and try and do it maybe in a year or something like that. And whatever happened, um, neither one of us were able to get in touch with one another. Um, as little as 12 years ago, um, a very close family member of mine tried to track him down. Um, actually went to different informations, um, various uh, various uh, phone directories, and actually made um, six or eight phone calls uh, to all these different Michael Smiths, but they couldn't find him. Um, he, I, there was a, a point in time where he was fond of um, going up to uh, Canada, so I'm wondering if maybe he didn't just uh, pack it in and move to Canada, because that was always like, a, I think, a fantasy of his to have like a hunting lodge and, and you know, maybe live, you know, in the wilderness or something like that. He, he wasn't a loner by any sense of the word, but he was just very fascinated with the Canadian wilderness. So maybe that's what he did. Maybe he got to live his dream. Did you have any close friendships while you were in the service? Um, Quite a few, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> I, I was um, in, in the... Um, in my location of where I stayed on board the ship in the birthing area, there was 150 of us in this one particular birthing area. So you got to know every one of them uh, personally on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, <clears throat> there was um, at, at first it was tough because you had a lot of people coming from the inner cities and a lot tougher areas. I grew up in the country, you know. I didn't know anything. I went in there, my eyes were as big as uh, half dollars, you know, not knowing what to expect, you know, what was going on. And here's these, you know, guys that were lived in the inner cities and, and faced, you know, things people don't even want to think about. But um, as time went on, we all became uh, very good friends. And, and you kind of had to. Um, you were working with these people every day. Uh, they were counting on you to do your job, and you were counting on them. And in certain instances, um, maybe even save your life. <clears throat> so, you, you know, wh whether you really truly really like somebody or not was not an issue uh on the boat it was whether or not you could uh, you had to work together that that's what it came to but yes i did i, I probably had i would say at least a couple of dozen that were uh, very close friends but like i said as things went on it was just not feasible to uh, uh unfortunately keep in touch what did you think of the officers um, I, I highly respected them, and I, and I really thought that they were capable people. The officers that we had on board the boat um, <clears throat> came up through the ranks, so to speak. Um, these were people that knew uh, weren't afraid to get their hands dirty and would come down and work with you and sweat right along with you. Um, being a lieutenant commander in the Navy is a big deal. Um, that's a three-striper. Um, those are usually people that walk around with the spiffy uniforms and the, and the scrambled eggs on their hat and... Um, are, are not ones to, to socialize, but these gentlemen actually came out and socialized with us. Um, we would go out to restaurants, we would have picnics, we would have outings or whatever, and they would hang right with us. So, yeah, we, we thought the world of them. Do you remember the names of any of your officers? I'm sorry, I don't. Um, their pictures and their names are in these books, but <laughs> we don't have the time really to go through that now. Did you have any reunions of the USS Enterprise? I belong to the um, USS Enterprise Alumni Association. Um, the Alumni Association meets once a year, usually in a different state of the country. Um, in 1996, I was fortunate that they came to Connecticut and they met in New London, so I drove to the reunion. 
um, these people, of course, came in from out of state. They stayed in the hotel and what have you, and that's where you would meet. And we would go there and meet and have breakfast, uh, dinners. Um, so I got to go um, meet some of these people. A uh, funny thing happened at one at the, at the reunion. Um, I the night they had the formal dinner. This lady came up to me and she said, uh, very well dressed, and she said, "Excuse me, young man." She says. Uh, are you here on behalf of your father? And I said, uh, no, ma'am, I'm not. I said, uh, I served on board the ship. And, and, and it took her back. And she says, you couldn't possibly have been on board the ship. I said, I was on board the boat from 19, uh, 1972 to 1975. I said, I, you know, and proceeded to tell her and she was totally blown away uh, because I've been told and, and I, I, I don't think so myself, but I'm told I look young. So uh, at that point, I mean, back in 96, I would have been uh, probably in my 30s, I believe, late 20s, early 30s. Um, and so uh, I just smiled and I thanked her and uh, <laughs> enjoyed the rest of the evening. Uh, I was given a, a special honor, though. Um, I During one of the outings that was uh, with the reunion, <clears throat> we went to um, a place in Noank, and I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's uh, um, Abbott's Lobster in the Rough. And the whole, it was a tour, and we went on a tour bus, and it was, I don't know, 35 of us, I think, that went. And I just happened to sit down at a table, and a gentleman come over, and he says, uh, do you mind if I sit with you? And I said, no, please do. And so we were just talking, and he says, uh, were you on the Enterprise? And I said, yes. And I explained to him, you know, time I was on, and he goes, oh. And I said, uh, were you on board, sir? You know, not knowing his name at that point in time, because we didn't introduce ourselves right off the bat. And he said, um, as a matter of fact, I was, he said, and it didn't go into great detail about it. And I said, oh, I said, well, I says, are you going to be at the, at the dinner this evening? And he goes, as a matter of fact, I am. He says, I'm the guest of honor. I said, oh, and come to find out he was a, a rear admiral. <laughs> and so we, we just uh, made fast friends at that point in time. And, and uh, he got the biggest kick out of it because I, I was uh, totally blown away that I was, you know, sitting across from a rear admiral, which you didn't have the chance to do when you were uh on active duty in most cases. Um, <clears throat> so what happened was, is he said, um, he got up from the table when he was done and he said, um, do you, um, are you here with anybody? And I said, no, sir, I'm not. He says, um, well, the funny thing is, he says, is they put me at this big table up at the head up there. He says, uh, I have nobody to sit with. He said, w would you mind, uh, would you uh, honor me by, by, you know, being my guest at the table? I said, absolutely. So sure enough, come that night, we went in there and I was sitting at the at the guest of honor table, which uh, I was very thrilled. Wow. Wait, was, did he happen to have been a rear admiral at the time you were serving on the Enterprise? No, no, no. Um, he, was, he was a rear admiral in the Navy at the time. I was on active duty, but uh, I'm, I don't remember where he said he was at that point in time. He might have been in Washington or he might have been at uh, one of the local commands. I'm not sure. <clears throat> Did you uh, keep a diary or a journal while you were overseas? Um, no, I didn't. But uh, I did send uh, postcards home and letters to my parents, and they saved them for me. So I do have those as, as uh, to, to kind of, they gave them back to me. Um, they just thought that rather than them keeping them, they would give them to me so I could pass them on to my uh, now, my you sons. Are going to give us copies of those to archive? Um, if you like. I have a couple of postcards. I don't have the other letters handy right now. All right, so when you're done in the Indian Ocean, when did you get news that you were finally going home? Um, at that point, when we were in the Indian, Indian Ocean, they said that they were going to actually make a trip around the Horn. Um, to do that, I would have completely circumnavigated the globe. I would have run around the world. <clears throat> Unfortunately, during that stint, we were called to... Um, that island, uh, Mauritius, uh, to, to fight that, um, to help them with the um, typhoon. typhoon, thank you, um, that hit them. And um, so, <laughs> unfortunately, it, it threw us off course and we never got to go. Um, that would have been probably one of my uh, biggest dreams was to have gotten to go around the horn because they said once you do, that, that's a special thing. In addition to going across the equator, and becoming a shellback, uh, going around the horn is another special um, um, honor that's that's put upon you by by navigating that that section. Um, so, in that kind of respect, I would have loved to have done that, but it just didn't work out. 
Can you describe a little, you talked about crossing the equator and becoming a shellback. Can you tell us? Um, when they do that, they have uh, ship's personnel who have already been across the equator. Um, they become King Neptune's uh, emissaries. Um, so they dress up in uh, different kinds of garb, whichever you have available. Some of them look like pi pirates. Uh, others just are wearing like scruffy, ragged clothes. And um, what they actually do is they put you through a series of events, um, which they have a, a famous one called the garbage chute, which is not very pleasant because the cooks uh, just uh, uh, save the garbage for a few days instead of uh, unloading it to the local uh, inhabitants of the sea. And uh, they put it in this kind of a canvas chute and you get to crawl through it. Um, they make you wear your clothes backwards. It, depending on where you are and what kind of, of an environment you're in or who you're in, it, it's all different. I heard from a bunch of uh, other people I got to meet. Um, but in, in my cases, they had you uh, go through this like obstacle course. And at the, at the very end, they have this gentleman who uh, kind of sort of resembles King Neptune. And uh, you get to kiss his belly and, uh, and then you're uh, officially sworn into the realm of uh, Brandy Deep, as they call it. And, and they give you this, uh, this wonderful certificate, which I don't know if it can be uh, seen or not. But uh, it, it states the, the time you went and where your longitude and latitude was and uh, th that you were inducted into uh, King Neptune's realm. <laughs> now, is this a common a ceremony for all? Uh... I understand that, that it, depending on if you go on a, on a civilian cruise and they cross the equator, that they put you through some kind of... Uh, some kind of a ritual, and, it, and it's all voluntarily from, from what I'm told, but when you're in the military, you don't have a choice. You're going through it whether you like it or not. <laughs> now, um, you only go through it once. What happens if you cross the equator another time? Well, that was why I wanted to go around the horn, because if I got to go around the horn, then I got to be the guy doling out the, the fun on, on the day that you got to uh, be in, in, initiated, uh, and that didn't happen, but that's okay. Uh, I had my one time anyway. Uh, so after assisting with the typhoon, did you finally get to go home after that? Um, we ended up going back to Hawaii because always on the way going back to your home port, you'd stop in Hawaii. Um, I'm not sure if it was to pick up orders or to debrief um, the captain or what have you, but there again, we would pull in and spend about four days or so in, in Hawaii and sightseeing, you know, if you didn't have the duty sightseeing, what have you, and uh then we would head back to uh, Alameda, California, our home port. Do you recall your last days in service? Um, yes, I do, and they were not very pleasant, <laughs> unfortunately. Do you want to talk about that? Um, I was asked if I wanted to re-enlist, and I was uh, actually seriously considering it. And they gave me a package, and they told me, you can have your choice of duty station anywhere in the world, that they could feasibly send you for 18 months and you would get $8,000 in cash as an incentive to enlist, to re-enlist. Um, they said in the meantime, if you like, you're, you're free to go home on leave and think about it. So I did. I took seven days and I went home and I was uh, explaining it to my parents and my parents said, well, why not? You know, you've been in it this long. Why don't you do it? So I said, okay, so I was going to go back and I was going to enlist. And, and when you re-enlist, you, you have an option of how you re-enlist. You can actually uh, get the choice to be in the backseat of a fighter if you want. Um, you can be on the bridge and the captain's administering it to you. Um, you, you have those privileges when you're, uh, when, it's, when you're in the environment I was. Um, so I went back and I went to, um, I, I forget what, what the office was called. I, I guess in today's standards, it'd be like uh, human resources. <laughs> on board the ship. And uh, this gentleman proceeds to tell me that he had my orders to go to my duty station, but as far as the cash went, um, it was knocked in half. Uh, he didn't have a uh, reasonable civil explanation for it, <clears throat> other than they, they were not going to pay me the money that they promised me. Um, it kind of soured me at that point, even though I still really was considering it. And um, then I found out that where I wanted to go for my duty station, they were only going to let me go for 12 months and not 18 months. Um, so I proceeded to tell them that I was going to pursue uh, civilian life at that point in time. And uh, at that point, I had two and a half months left on board the ship. Um, it, it, needless to say, they made my life uh, miserable, um, to put it mildly. I had to make sure that I was uh, on board the boat. I was dressed. I was uh, My shoes were spit-shined. 
Um, my clothes were, uh, you know, uh, ironed and, and everything was in order. I, I couldn't, um, uh, I couldn't sneeze out of place, uh, for the two and a half months. So, uh, now the last two and a half months, you were still actually on the boat in the harbor? At on the boat in the harbor at Alameda. That's correct. Yeah. They were, um, they were doing some yard work on the ship. They were refitting it for certain things. And, um, so while you were allowed to, you know, if you didn't have the duty, you were allowed to leave. So what I would do is uh, I would snap up all these guys' duty and they would pay me, and uh, which was perfectly legal at the time because you were doing their shift for them. So it would be like if you went to work overtime for somebody who called out. Um, and this way here, they were allowed to go spend time with their wives, girlfriends, um, just go party in town if they wanted to, whatever. And I stayed on board the boat the whole two and a half months. Do you recall your last day in service? <clears throat> yes, um, I was uh, summoned to the uh, the commanding officer of the 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 unit that that signed your final orders, um, and I got in front of him, and he was giving me the third degree. I was standing at attention, and um, he went up and down me, um, and he was actually uh, screaming choice words at me, telling me that I was making a terrible mistake by getting out and. I should consider re-enlisting and what have you. And then he looked at me and he said, and I'm not signing your orders until you go get a haircut. Now, it's <laughs> it, when you're in port, you really don't have people that are readily available. So I had to run around only because I knew the ship backwards and forwards at that point in time. I had to find where the, the crew was that did the haircuts. I found this guy. I had to pay him 25 bucks to come back and cut my hair to... Uh, um, my hair was... Uh, official regulation at the time, but not suited to this guy. He wanted to see it uh, cut some more. So I had to have this guy just bring me back and just uh, almost literally shave my head. Um, so when he was done, I went back and I stood in front of the guy and he looked at me and he says, uh, gave me a few more choice words, but he then finally signed my papers and he handed me my uh, my ID and, and and he said, get out of my sight. That was that was my, <laughs> my, my last foray in the thing. So I went up to the uh, to the hangar deck at that point, because that's where you went off. They had a gangway leading from the hangar deck down to the dock, you know, the pier. And um, there, there's a, a gentleman, an officer on duty, and I had to salute him and, and ask his permission to leave and showed him my papers and stuff. And uh, he wasn't happy that I was walking either. He says, uh, um, get your stuff and your ass off my boat right now and gave me uh, 10 minutes to unload all my belongings. So luckily I had... Uh, a few of my shipmates that were there, and they um, helped me carry all my stuff down. <clears throat> all the, uh, you know, a few things that I had accumulated while I was on the boat. So I then, uh, um, I had relatives, by the way, that lived in uh, uh, probably about 23 miles outside of where the base was. So uh, I proceeded to uh, hail a taxi, and uh, the taxi took me to their home. And uh, I stayed there for, um, I think it was um, about 48, 72 hours. It's two, three days, whichever. And then I uh, arranged to get a plane ticket and I went home. And what did you do in the weeks after you got home? Um, I decided that it was probably about time I went back to school and maybe learned something constructive. So I uh, uh, signed up to, into a, uh, a um, junior college, uh, which was uh, Middlesex Community College at that time, um, which is located in Middletown, Connecticut. And I proceeded to take... Uh, business courses, uh, marketing management and the like, uh, thinking that I wanted to enter into that type of a field. Um, I was unfortunately disillusioned after about eight months because at that time they didn't have their own um, staff. Um, they were um, other professors that were hired from other universities to come in and teach the classes and they did not care whether you were there or not, whether you learned any of the material. They were just being paid to come in and do their thing. Um, so I dropped out of that. I, I withdrew and <clears throat> I came home and um, my parents were asking me what I was going to do now. And I was uh, luckily uh, uh, afforded a, an education by the GI Bill. So I uh, saw this advertisement in the, in the newspaper and it said more school of business. You know, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, and we guarantee you a, a, an associate's degree in 18 months and come into our program. So I went and interviewed over there and they thought I was a good candidate for it. And they uh, signed me up and I, and I took the, the classes and I got out of there with the business management. Uh, it was a diploma, they called it. It wasn't an, of, an official associate's degree. Um, from there, I had um, also uh, applied to work for the state of Connecticut. 
Um, that was back in uh, 78. Um, in 1979, I'm... Uh, Thankful and grateful to say that I was hired by the uh, Department of Public Safety and have been there for what will be 30 years, August 24th of 2009. Did you join any veterans organizations? I belong to the uh, Jerry Smatras Post uh, 10732, which is located in Berlin, Connecticut. And that's a VFW post? It's a VFW post, yes it is. I'm um, sorry to say I'm not a, a, a very active member. I am a member in good standing, um, and I do try and attend events when it's possible, but um, work and home life and, and family activities unfortunately don't uh, uh, allow you or afford you the possibility to uh, attend all the time. So, um. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? If you're asking me if I would do it again, yes, I would. The only reason I would go back in again and probably go in the same line of work as I would, if I was afforded to have the same knowledge I have right now about things, I would have uh, <clears throat> made my career a lot different. I, I had other options while I was in there, and I turned them down because I was uh, naive to, to the other possibilities of, of what existed and um, just stayed in, in that realm because I was comfortable and I was uh, content. How did your service affect your life? Um, I, depending on who you talk to, <laughs> some people would say it made me a, a, a decent human being. Another person, other people might tell you that I'm a little over the top and maybe even anal retentive, but uh, I think it helps me to I'm a person who likes to keep his life organized and in order. And if you went upstairs to look in my drawers, you would see my things are folded like they were when I was in the military. And I do that for space sake because it just makes more sense to keep everything like that. Because back on the boat, space was limited. Very limited. You slept in a, in a, a three by six was your cot. It was a metal rack um, and you had two units that opened up towards the top of the bunk above you and that's all you had there was no hanging no no private stores no closet space nothing and you had a pull-out drawer underneath for your shoes so you had space to have a pair of dress shoes for inspections and for when you uh, had to go to official functions and then you had a pair of everyday work shoes um, you were afforded enough laundry to keep you in uh, work attire which uh, were similar to dungarees, uh, wearing dungarees and, and uh, what they called at that time a chambray shirt. You had long sleeve for cold weather, short sleeve for the hot weather. Uh, most of my environment was wearing short sleeve shirts. Um, when we were on our duty station, you wore a special kind of shirt that identified you. They had different colors on board an aircraft carrier. Mine was red with a black stripe um, and a G in the middle of it to signify that you were a part of the weapons unit G division. Um, and that's how they knew. And then you had yellow shirts, purple shirts, uh, green shirts, white shirts, you know, all the different functions, all the different people that, that participated on the boat. How many people would sleep in one area? In, in my, my specific location was 150. And it depended. Some of the birthing areas were actually bigger and some were smaller. So you had 150 guys all in that one area with those? Three bunks guys. stacked one on top of the other, some put together side by side, um, and each one three by six with two pull-up storage compartments. Um, air conditioning was non-existent, um, so if it wasn't cool outside, it wasn't cool in your birthing area. And in most of my environment, when I was in the Tonkin Gulf, it was uh, 120 to 125 degrees all the time. You, you just literally sweated day and night. You, you did learn a few tricks, though. Uh, if you went and took a shower and you managed to keep yourself from sweating, you could sprinkle powder on yourself and on your bunk, and you could maybe get a, a decent night's sleep without uh, waking up soaked, and uh, that's just the way it was. Joe, are there any other memorable experiences or incidents uh, or stories that we haven't discussed? Um. <clears throat> There is one, but um, I think I'm going to forego it. It was a, a particular instance um, when I went home on leave, 
and I just rather not uh, discuss it. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Is there anything else that you would like to add that we haven't talked about? Um, other than the fact that I was afforded um, well, what I would consider a, uh, <clears throat> a good life um, and got to see a lot of... Um, I was uh, given what I believe was a, a, a great opportunity to serve my country and to um, <clears throat> to get to see a lot of uh, interesting places. Um, um, whether or not <clears throat> what I did was um, <clears throat> a good thing or not, um, uh, I felt I um, <clears throat> excuse me, I felt I uh, served my country uh, um, with great distinction and honor, and um, I don't regret a minute of it. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Joe, I would like to thank you for your service to our country and thank you for your interview. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.